He was living in a period that was over a century ago and today when we think about Ismaili studies or Fatimid studies, you know, just even at the institute we have a range of publications, uh, several original primary texts translated and edited, uh, you know, the whole field has grown uh, significantly. His interest in Ismaili studies across all these centuries was very vast and very deep, as it were. And in collecting and cataloging these manuscripts and then also translating and editing them, he made available sources that were just not known. And it allowed us to think about Ismaili studies in an entirely different way. It's, it's as if a door had opened and you could now see a view that was never possible before. I was a graduate student at the University of California in Berkeley in 1960s, in fact, studying economics. But Ismaili and Shi'i histories were my hobbies. In the great library of Berkeley, I came across a large number of uh, publications by Vladimir Ivanov. At that time, we did not have too many, you see, secondary. Once I began to read these publications, I realized how path-breaking and significant. He is addressing his communication to Ivano. He's saying, I'm interested in writing the history of the Ismaili Imams, and I've heard that you are a scholar of Ismaili studies. Can you guide me on how do I develop my understanding of the Ismaili history. The person that I'm talking about is, of course, Dr. Farhad Daftari, as we know him, the director of the Institute of Ismaili Studies. Now, you see, Ivano's contribution goes beyond his publications. The Ismailis, until more recent times, were mainly studied on the basis of evidence uh, actually collected or even fabricated by their adversaries. The modern scholarship in the field, the modern progress in the field, had to await the recovery and study of a large number of Ismaili manuscripts. And this work was pioneered by Vladimir Ivanov. In doing this work, Ivanov also cooperated. He worked with several other scholars. And so it's not just that he was an excellent scholar who brought about uh, you know, access to these texts, but he also made these texts available to several other people, which meant that the whole field of Fatimid studies has progressed exponentially with the kind of foundations he provided. He had a very difficult you see, personal life. He was a lonely man, bitter man, because he, he was really forced to to leave his native country after the Yusuf Revolution. Vladimir Ivanov was born on uh, 3rd of March, uh, 1886. He, uh, his uh, parents were uh, very educated people. His father, Alexei Andreevich uh, Ivanov, uh, was a military doctor. His mother, uh, Maria Filipovna Marchinka, uh, was also educated and very cultured lady. In fact, late, later, Ivanov uh, uh, was saying that everything, everything which is good in him is owed to his mother. Vladimir Ivanov uh, was uh, sent to Central Asia by the director of the Asiatic Museum, Pyotr Oldenburg, who gave him a task to study Yagnobi language. In the spring of 1980, when Ivanov left uh, St. Petersburg, he didn't know that he will never come back. 
the revolution reached the far flung of the Russian Empire. And um, obviously Ivanov couldn't do his fieldwork in Yarnov and uh, he left for Persia hoping that uh, after some time when things uh, come down he would return back to Russia. But uh, it's not meant to happen. He began like a sort of wandering emigre to Iran and you know, to Afghanistan. And Ivanov uh, happened to be in Iran in the early 20th century and uh, he started working for a bank, a Russian bank, and he, he was using that as an opportunity to start doing Oriental studies. His first encounters with Ismailis in Iran is in 1912. The people whom he meets are very secretive. They are aware that they are practicing their tariyat, so whatever Ivanov asks them, they do not really reveal too much. It stumbles upon something which is, which is the beginning of modern Ismaili studies because up, up until that moment, knowledge of the existence of Ismailis is almost completely absent from literature and from scholarship and he just opens the floodgates of the new information, uh, so to speak. Finally, uh, he found a home, or what to him perhaps seemed to be a home in the city of, you see, Bombay. He visits India twice. He visits India for the first time in 1914. But then in 1920, he comes back, he decides to settle down in India. I would say the first visit uh, was based on his uh, understanding of what India was, what he had read about India. In fact, he starts his journey on a steamer uh, from the Middle East and he's coming to India. It's a 10, 12 day journey. He's pretty excited about it. He writes about it in his autobiography. And he suddenly, his, his image of India that he had read about in, in various works is shattered. And he says that this is nowhere close to the fairy tale India that I had read about. If I were to summarize his reasons for coming to India, I would say his, his interest in the Arabic Persian manuscripts and awareness that there was a large collection of these manuscripts. While he is in Mumbai, he comes across some Ismailis. These Ismaili leadership offers him a possibility of working with them. Then Imam Sultan Shah approves his appointment. In 1931, he starts working uh, for the Ismailis and he suggests that we need to have Ismaili society rather than Islamic Research Association where we can do Ismaili studies and that was the beginning of Ismaili studies and in 1936 they establish uh, a society called Ismaili Studies Society and they invite scholars from around the world. And the Imam commissioned Ivanov to start studying the history and thought of the community. And then this marked the next four decades of his life, which were devoted to three tasks. One was to recover further Ismaili texts, and secondly, to make these texts also available to scholars worldwide. And thirdly, to study, publish, edit, and translate as many of these texts as he possibly could. So the first fruit of this period of his life was this guide. This provided the first scientific frame for the field and this also for the first time attested to the richness and diversity of Ismaili textual sources. Uh, Vladimir Ivanov, he was a product of uh, Russian Orientalism. He studied under the guidance of some of the best uh, Russian Orientalists. Uh, the real 
work of Ivanov on manuscript started when he visited uh, Asiatic Museum. Yeah, that was the center of uh, academic work which was taking place uh, on manuscripts on Islamic studies in Russia. Ivanov himself was one of the contributors to the collection of uh, Asiatic Museum. Uh, he brought uh, uh, 1047 manuscripts from uh, Bukhara and today this collection is known as uh, Bukhara Collection at the Institute of Oriental Manuscript. He supplemented literary sources with archaeological and epigraphic sources as a result of which we have his thorough study of the fortresses of Alamut and Lamassar and he's also the pioneer who discovered the mausolea of several of the Ismaili imams of the Anjudan period in the village of Anjudan, not too, not too far from Qom in central Iran. In 1937-1938, he discovered the tombs of uh, Ismaili imams after the collapse of Alamut, which was later on introduced as the Anjudan revival period, which was the first physical evidence of the existence and also of the revival of the Ismaili community after the collapse of the, of the Alamut state, when everybody thought that they've been completely wiped off the face of the earth. Also, he discovered books and manuscripts, in particular the Pandiyat Javan Mardi, which was authored by Imam Hussain Sirullah. That took a couple of uh, decades until Ivanov really gets into the line of publishing these various works on Ismailis. <laughs> When we think about the contributions that Ivanov made to Fatimid studies, more specifically then, um, there are some very interesting insights because he, so in this work called The Rise of the Fatimids, for example, that got published in 1942, Ivanov puts together, makes available some of these earliest Fatimid texts from Qadian Oman's Ifti Tawdawa, the Istitar al-Imam, the Sirat Hajib al-Mansur, and several others. And in doing that, he, 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 he makes available the Arabic text, so he edits it, he gives you the English translation, and he does a comparison with other sources that are around. Of course, some of these texts that Ivanov had made available were my go-to sources um, to, to study and to research and to look at. So in that sense, I feel that the scholarship I have gone on to do in Fatimid studies has been directly impacted uh, by the groundwork that Ivanov laid in making these texts available. His book on Alamut and Lamsa was, which was a kind of archaeological study of the two fortresses. And incidentally, uh, when I was browsing through the pages, I came across an image and I immediately recognized the landscape behind it. Then I realized there was a photo of my mum as a kid. The book was published in the 1960s. Later on, when we published uh, his autobiography in Russian, um, and I edited it, actually it, uh, I realized how uh, extraordinary life he had and uh, how much inspiration we can uh, uh, draw from his uh, dedication to the Somali studies, and I think it, it, it influenced me in many ways. The most striking attribute of him to me is his total, you see, dedication and devotion to his uh, scholarship, which he maintained and retained until the very end, until the final days of his life. 